Haggai is uh, one of those tricky to find books at the back of the Old Testament, sandwiched in between the two Zeds of Zephaniah and Zechariah. Uh, so if you turn to the end of your Old Testament, and if you begin turning back and you get to Zechariah, turn back one more, you'll get to Haggai. If you turn back to Zephaniah, you're too far back. Um, <clears throat> so let's hear uh, from the book of Haggai. We're going to look at chapter two, and we're going to look at the next nine verses So let's hear God speak to us through his holy and perfect word. Let's hear God speak. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Sheetal, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, to the high priest and the remnant of the people. Ask them, Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I have covenanted with you when you came up out of Egypt and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the desired of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 410 AD, uh, a priest called Jerome stood on a hillside just outside Rome. And he began to weep as he saw 40,000 Visigoths, and Visigoths were um, an eclectic gathering of Germanic barbarian tribes. Jerome wept as he saw 40,000 Visigoths sweep into Rome to tear down uh, the, the Christian churches that had been built there, to set them on fire and to raid them for any, anything that was worth stealing any gold or any silver or anything that was worth it. And as he stood weeping on this hillside, he feared for the future of the world around him. Rome represented far more than just a city. Rome was in some ways the center of power of the empire that had lasted nearly a thousand years. Rome represented civilization. It was because of Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, that the gospel that we believe here in Northern Ireland had been able to travel so freely, so quickly, because there was a sense of peace and of civil order that was brought about through Rome. The Romans brought with them roads and infrastructure and a sense of law and order that had allowed the gospel to spread swiftly across an entire world in the the views of ancient readers of the New Testament. Rome had come to represent, in a sense, the center of a wheel from which, spoken out from the center, the gospel spread to all the nations. And for Jerome, watching the city he loved burn, it felt as if the very faith that he had confessed was also on fire. The civilization that he had known his entire life seemed to be amidst the ruins as well. And he remarked that the city that had taken the whole world was now taken. That's a situation very, very similar to where Haggai would have found himself. Haggai, an ancient Jew, would have found himself standing in ancient Jerusalem. Jerusalem, where God is meant to dwell in the temple where as a beacon amongst the nation, God's people were to show what being a follower of the covenant God, Yahweh, meant, to show the good news of of what it meant to worship this God, 
that was meant to show how wonderful this God was. And instead of it being a beacon, Jerusalem, the city of God, lay in ruins. And the temple, the temple which was to be the footstool through which God's presence was most clearly manifest in all the world, that temple was completely destroyed. For Haggai, it was not just that he was trying to fix up an old house that needed a bit of repair. It was that the entire world he had known and longed for as a Jew lay in ruins. I think as Christians, we are entering a space and time where we can empathize a bit with that. I think even before COVID, most of us would have said that church life in the Western world is not what it used to be. Whilst we in Mays have known um, a wonderful bit of growth and are seeing people come to faith and we are a growing church and that's wonderful, I am sure all of us are aware that we are probably more the exception than the rule. Northern Ireland, that was some ways represented um, an evangelical stronghold in a secular Europe. We're fastly becoming as secular as any other part of Europe. The agreed upon morality that we once thought we shared with all of our neighbors is quickly going between our fingertips like sand. And as we begin to see our faith, not just mocked in the public square, but seen as an evil, we perhaps feel like Haggai and like Jerome. We stand among the ruins of what was once something great and powerful and influential. And as we look to come out of this pandemic, we are faced with the task of rebuilding. Rebuilding to what we think normal church life might be, but rebuilding what it means to live the gospel out in a clear and visible way for everyone to see. That is why this book Haggai speaks to us, I think, in a way that is profound because Haggai is writing from a situation much like our own. We're gonna look at what this passage calls to us and how it speaks to us in three separate ways and where it points our vision. The first thing that we read in this, this little section was that there is a group of people who are looking back, a group of people who are looking back. If you look down with me at verse three, we read that there were some older folks in the, the exile community in Jerusalem who had begun to complain. And Haggai is used as a, a vessel for God to say this. Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? There would have been an old generation of Jewish exiles who could remember whenever they were small children going and worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem. They could remember the sights, the smells, the opulence of the, the gold furniture and adornments that were around the temple, the sense of grandeur, the sense of influence, the sense of power. And they have arrived back to a Jerusalem that is ruins. And as they are about to rebuild the temple, this older generation looks at where they are building the foundations and they begin to realize that the temple that they are about to sacrifice so much to build pales in comparison to the temple they remember of their childhood. The temple they remembered of their childhood was rich and opulent and grand. And the temple that they are building will be smaller, will be drab. They're beginning to feel discouraged because, as we read here, the temple that they are building looks like nothing to them, to the one they remember in their mind's eye. If you'll allow me to paint with very broad brushes, broad brushes, broad brushes for a minute, I think we can all be tempted to think a little bit like this generation. 
There's some of us here, and if I can use the sociological term here, maybe a bit of a, you can remember back to a time whenever Christianity in Northern Ireland was at its height. That was probably in around the 1960s, um, if you go by the attendance membership within Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Some of you perhaps can remember back that far and can remember a time whenever everyone you knew, if they wouldn't have described themselves as a Christian, they at least belonged to a church. And if they did belong to a church, or even if they didn't belong to a church, there was a sense of respect held for those who were Christians. Ministers, well, not like myself, because I'm not really a full one yet, I still have my L plates on, but ministers like William would have been reverend up and down the country, and no one would ever have called him William. He would have been the Reverend Henry. Why? Because as a minister, he would have been respected because Christianity in those days, with its numbers and its power and its influence, it was valued what Christians had to say. They wanted to interview ministers on the TV or the radio and find out what they had to say. We were big. Our churches were perhaps full. And we thought, this is it. We're at a time of power and influence, and isn't it great? And some of you can remember, remember those days. Now look at the church around you and say, this looks so different. And there may be some of you who maybe think and mourn that the days of the church that you remembered growing up in as a child seem to be past. And you can't quite get back to them no matter how hard you try. And you maybe are like the generation here who look at the temple that's being built and go, this is nothing like the temple I remember. There may be a slightly younger generation of you here, maybe um, Generation X or Millennial, to use the technical terms. And maybe you were like me, you grew up, and it wasn't so much that it was bad to be a Christian, but it was just weird. You know, there was other Christians in your class at school, but we were just seen as a little bit weird. And so we thought the solution was to try and create a Christianity that was respectable, was cool, one that gained some sort of bit of acceptance. You know, the discipleship that we went through was mainly through a subculture of a sanctified version of the world's culture. And we thought that if we can just get people to stop thinking that Christianity is weird, it will be okay and will be accepted. But the reality is that there is a generation coming up now, a generation of folks in this church who will grow up their entire lives knowing Christianity not as the cultural power and behemoth as it once did, not as something weird that needs a bit of acceptance, but something that is an active evil in the world. We're at a point where our faith is viewed not just as weird, but as dangerous because we don't go along with what the world says on sexuality with what the world says on morality, because we make exclusive truth claims, because we talk about heaven and hell, because we believe that there is such a real thing as a real God and real consequences, we will be maligned and we will be seen as evil. And we, it will no longer be the case as perhaps some of us maybe thought it was where Christians were viewed as good living people who are just trying to live a good lives, more and more the world that we are living in will begin to see us as people who are morally wrong and abhorrent. We will become like the exile community, rebuilding amongst the ruins with threats coming in from the outside all the day long. And the temple that we are building will not be perhaps as majestic as the one we remember in our mind's eye. But it's important. It's important. I don't say all this just to discourage you this morning. I don't say all this just to be depressive. Because if you'll notice in this passage, the people of God were rebuilding the temple. And if we read through Nehemiah's account of the rebuilding of the temple, they were doing so as foreign dignitaries were threatening to invade and kill them so that whenever they had to build the temple, they had to build it with a sword in one hand and a brick in the other. There were so many things working against the people of God at that time as they were trying to rebuild amidst the ruins. And their hope 
didn't come from a sense of being acceptable to the cultures around them, and it didn't come from a sense of getting power and influence again. But as we see from this passage, their hope came from this, that they were to look upwards. Having had the discouragement of God pointing out that the temple they are building will look like nothing compared to the temple they remember, God then says this in verse four. He says, but now be strong, be strong, for I am with you. The hope that we have as we go into a difficult stage as a church is not in being acceptable to the culture around us and is not trying to hearken back to days of yore, but it is that we have something that nobody else has, and that is that we have the presence of God resting, remaining, and abiding in each and every one of us. The hope that sustained the people of God through this time of rebuilding was that God was with them, so that he said that I am with you. Do not fear. Do not fear. And in this section, he promises three things. He promises to give them riches. He promises to give them uh, glory. And he promises to give them peace. Now, he promises to give them riches whenever he says that the gold will be mine and the silver will be mine. And we might look at that and we're uncomfortable with the idea of God ever giving money. But what that meant for this people was that there would come a day when the temple would be as glorious as the one they remembered, even better And that would happen 300 years later, whenever King Herod, yes, the King Herod from Nativity, would, would, in a sense, rebuild and revamp the temple in a way that it would be filled with all the splendor that these people could remember. But that would be 300 years away. So for many of them, they would toil and struggle, and they wouldn't see the fruit of their labor until 300 years later. God promised them glory. If you look down, he said that, as the Lord Almighty, in a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and all the nations will come to me, and I will fill this house with glory. And what do we read about in the New Testament? We read of stories of Jesus being in Jerusalem, and Jews from across the world flocking to Jerusalem for temples or for for worship and for services and for festivals as the world descended on Jerusalem and God's temple was filled with his glory. And God promises them peace at the very end of this section where he says, I will grant peace in this place. And he did grant peace in that place. And the temple was able to be rebuilt and it was able to stand for hundreds of years after until 70 AD. God's promises still stood sure. Why? Because if we look down in this passage, he had covenanted with them when he brought them out of Egypt. Our God is not a God who's in a habit of breaking promises. And so with us, God makes promises from this passage. Whenever we read of Old Testament prophecy, often there's two ways it's fulfilled. It's either fulfilled in the coming of Jesus or some way, but it's often filled in a much richer way whenever he will come again to rule and reign and power the second coming. And in this passage, we see the richness of what we have as Christians if we look up. We see that the riches we have are not riches of gold and silver, but are riches that we read about in in 1 Peter For we have a treasure that is kept in heaven for you that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Or whenever Jesus said that store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. As Christians, we have a treasure that is kept in heaven for us that is unspoilable and undefilable because it is a treasure of being in the fullness of the presence of God. We know a glory far greater than these saints would ever know. For them, they thought the glory would be that God would come and dwell in the temple again in the Holy of Holies. But as Christians, where do we say that God's spirit dwells? He dwells in you. He dwells in you. How much more glorious is that 
that you do not need to go to a building to have God with you, but by receiving and resting in Jesus, the Spirit of God remains and rests on you. How glorious is that? And we have a peace that comes from that because we know that we have an inheritance that cannot be taken away from us and cannot fade. We have a richness and a glory that is held for us as we were listening to at the start of the service by God who holds us fast. Finally, this passage gets us to look forward. I've talked a lot about things about what we believe, but practically, what does this mean that we do? What does this passage mean that we do? And thankfully, this passage is actually applied in the New Testament. If you have a Bible open, can I really encourage you to turn to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Because the writer of the Hebrews quotes this passage to Christians living in the New Testament, living in the same sort of era as we are. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26, the writer says this. He says that at that time, his voice shook the, he- shook the earth, but now he has promised, and he begins to quote what we've just read from Haggai, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Since therefore we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So what are we meant to do with the fact that we are promised these things by God? What are we meant to do with the fact that we are in the process of receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken? We are to worship. We are to worship. As we as Christians look to move forward and look to try and minister to a world in a post-pandemic world, what is it that we offer? What is it that we offer the world? We live in a culture that is being increasingly influenced by an idea that a psychologist, Philip Reef, called therapeutic culture. And he wrote a famous book on it called The Triumph of the Therapeutic in the 1970s. And it's basically an idea that everything in our culture is trying to move us towards feeling good in some way. That's why we've got films that want to leave us feeling good, that tell us to be who you can be and to live your best life and to be who you want. Because it's all about us in some way and all about making us feel good. And I think as Christians, we've imbibed that a wee bit. And sometimes we think what we offer the world is something that will make them feel better or make their lives better in some way. And that, that isn't true. That isn't true. Because if you look at the Apostle Paul or Jesus himself, often following after Jesus or following the will of God does not lead to a happy, content life. It can often lead to suffering. But what we offer is this. We offer our worship. We offer our worship of a God who is an all-consuming fire. That might not sound like very much, but I think that's because we have imbibed an idea that somehow God should be grateful that we worship him. I think sometimes we've imbibed an idea that God should be thankful that we take the effort to take time out to worship him. But if you look down at this passage, notice how it talks about God in Hebrews 12. It says, so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. We do not worship a small God. And we do not worship a God who is somehow in need of our help. But we worship a God who is a consuming fire. And so as we draw close to worship him, as we do now this morning, how is it that we get to draw close to someone who is a consuming fire? We do so because we do so in the name of Jesus. That is what it means to worship acceptably. So what we worship or what we offer the world is worship in the name of Jesus. We offer the world access and relationship and the ability to know the creator of all the heavens and earth who is a consuming fire because we offer people to come and know Jesus. I think there is a tendency to think what we want to offer the world is something else. 
You know that as Christians, we want to get people in the door somehow and we want to dial down the God stuff as much as we can. But the reality is, is that that's the only thing we, what we offer the world around us. Worship. And worship in the name of Jesus. So can I encourage you going forward as you begin to think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what it means to witness for Jesus in the world around us. It is not trying to make light of your faith. It is not trying to water down your faith. It is not trying to dismiss your faith, but it's saying that you have something worth sharing because you have a savior, Jesus, and you have a relationship where you can know and commune with and have union with the God who is a consuming fire. And that is a great hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news that you've given us Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and our salvation. Lord, would we draw near to you with reverence and awe this morning and worship you acceptably because we are doing so in the name of Jesus. Father, would he be the name that we want to honor and praise? For it's in his name we pray. Amen.